Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am. Here's some bears that are whispering secrets to each other. So far in this course, we have spent a lot of time talking about, well, a lot of different things. This week is going to be the first week where we see a word that we have seen before and we get to learn about what that word actually means. The words that we've seen before that we're going to recognize this week are the word segmentation fault. He gotcha. You know, those words that are the cause of hours and hours and hours of frustration when writing code in C. We're going to figure out what these words segmentation fault actually means, what the cause of a segmentation fault actually is. Eventually, we're going to learn that the word segmentation fault are really just a historical artifact that don't really reflect the way that modern computer systems and modern operating systems actually work, but at least we'll understand what those words mean. Hooray! When we left our introduction to virtual memory with this idea of these new base and bounds registers and this idea of an MMU, a memory management unit, where we've got this new bit of hardware and this extra little bit of information that we keep in our process control blocks, we had a primitive virtual memory system. The, the problem that we have with base and bounds is, is mainly that we're allocating entire address spaces. And this is one of those unrealistic assumptions just to get us started thinking about virtual memory. The problem that we were left with this idea of allocating entire virtual address spaces was that we had this big chunk in the middle. And I'm gonna show you a figure from chapter 15 again. I think this is probably the fourth time I've shown this figure now. I'm gonna show you this figure, figure 15.2. We've got this process, we've got the entire virtual address space for this process, it's 16 kilobytes in size. We've got our code section at the top, we've got our heap beneath that, we've got our stack at the bottom. This full virtual address space that we've allocated, there's this region in between the heap and the stack that is entirely unused. It's been allocated as an operating system. We've told this process, we're not going to use this for anything else. You are free to do with it as you please. The process then probably isn't going to use this for anything. And that kind of just means that this space has been allocated, but it's basically just being wasted. It's not actually being used by this process. With this specific example, we're, we're talking about 16 kilobyte address spaces. These are, these are tiny. Like, you know, we're, we're thinking about having gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes and terabytes of memory in a modern system. When we've got a 16 kilobyte address space, <laughs> this is like, you know, 14 kilobytes of space. It's not really something that's worth thinking about. As we grow these address spaces into something bigger, as we make them become multi-gigabyte address spaces, that space that would be left unused in the middle, think about this for your own simple programs, that space that's in the middle would become huge. It would become this vast waste of space that we could be using for other things like running other processes on our system. Base and bounds works. It's a functional system, but it leaves a little bit to be desired. Really specifically, we've got this idea or this problem of internal fragmentation. We've allocated space for this process and the process is never going to use that space. So we wanna try and solve this issue. We wanna try and figure out how we can change the approach to what we're doing so that we're not allocating and marking this space as used when a process really is never going to use that space. One of the other problems that we have with base and bounds beyond this internal fragmentation and is kind of partially caused by what we're talking about here, allocating full address spaces, is that we have to allocate full address spaces. That means that our system, the processes that are running on our system, are explicitly limited to having an address space that is smaller than the installed memory on a system. So the address spaces that we have for these processes must be smaller than physical memory. 
If we think about that on realistic systems, like the machines that we're running right now, with 64-bit address spaces, in reality we're not actually using the full 64 bits, but it's not really important for this discussion. Even with 48 bits that we actually are using, allocating that full address space is way, way beyond the size of the memory that you have installed on your system right now physically. Using these really tiny address spaces, it's, it's okay for, for thinking about it, for thinking about virtual memory, but it's not really going to work very well in practice. So we've got two main problems with base and bounds. The first is that by allocating full address spaces, we're allocating memory that could otherwise be used for something else. We've got this problem of internal fragmentation and we, we could really be using this for something else, like having additional processes in the system. The other problem with this is that we're limited to having address spaces that are smaller than the physical amount of memory that we have backing. We want to be able to have processes that believe their address space is actually much, much bigger than the amount of physical memory that we have installed on a system. We're going to begin to solve this problem using an approach called segmentation. And there's that word again, segmentation. The idea of segmentation is actually fairly straightforward. Instead of blindly allocating the entire address space for an entire process, we take advantage of our own knowledge about the way that memory is laid out with a process, and we use that information to help us have these blocks, these segments of memory that we're going to allocate instead of allocating an entire address space. So here's figure 16.1. Figure 16.1 shows us an entire address space again, but this time we're really explicitly marking these three different regions in memory. We've got program code at the top, we've got the heap kind of in the middle here, and then we've got the stack at the very bottom. You, you might notice that there's a bit of a gap in between program code and the heap, and for now we're going to ignore that. We'll come back to it though. We're going to come back to and explain why there's that little gap between the code region and the heap. So instead of having one base and bounds register per process, we're going to generalize on this. We're going to have one base and bounds register per segment of memory that we've got for this process. In figure 16.1, we've got a program code section, we've got a heap segment, and we've got a stack segment. That means that for this process, we're going to have three base and bounds registers, one for each of those segments. Figure 16.2 now is showing what this looks like in physical memory, where figure 16.1 is showing the virtual memory for a process, the address space for a process, Figure 16.2 now is showing what this looks like physically in memory. And let's compare this now with figure 15.2. In figure 16.2, we still have that operating system chunk at the top. The operating system itself is code, and it needs to have its, its own code put into memory somewhere so that it's able to run. In this situation, in figure 16.2, we've got one process and its address space has been segmented. So we've got three segments that we're allocating as the operating system. We've got the stack at the top, we've got the code below that, and we've got the heap below the code. This is different from figure 15.2 where we had this entire chunk of memory that was allocated for this address space. It's also rearranged a little bit differently than we had with figure 15.2 in that the code and the heap are actually physically located below the stack in this example. The big difference that we have here is that with figure 16.2 where we're allocating segments, we're only allocating as much as is needed by the process right now. We're not blindly allocating the entire address space for this process to begin with, but instead we're allocating the segments that are minimally required for this process to get going. So that in theory means that, for example, the heap might actually be some zero-sized segment at the beginning because there has been no dynamic allocation by the operating system. 
So to be clear, even though we've changed the way that we've done this allocation, we've, we're only allocating segments for this process, this is in physical memory. The perception of the process itself is that it still has access to that entire address space and the address space is laid out in the way that it's expecting it to be laid out. Code at the top, heat beneath that, stack at the very bottom. The really obvious benefit of this is that we're now able to put many more processes than we were able to before. Allocating those full 16 kilobytes uh, address spaces limited us to really having three processes running on that system with 64 kilobytes of physical memory. Now with these segments, we can have many, many more processes running on this because we're only allocating a small percentage of the address space for each of these processes. The other benefit that I, that I kind of mentioned here but didn't directly say is that each of these segments is independently relocatable. We were able to relocate the entire address space before previously, you know, we could take it out of slot two and put it into slot three, but now we're able to take these different segments, code, heap, and stack, and rearrange those in any way we want when the process is not running. Remember that with base and bounds, we, we needed hardware support for this. And the form of the hardware support initially was a couple of registers and the MMU to actually do the translations from virtual addresses to physical addresses. In that segmentation as a generalization of base and bounds, it, it kind of just means that we need additional registers on top of those one set of base and bounds registers. So we still need this MMU, we still need this physical hardware that does the translations from virtual addresses to physical addresses, but now we're gonna have three sets of registers, at least three sets of registers. One set of registers for the code section, one set of registers for the heap section, and one set of registers for the stack section. Figure 16.3 is showing the set of base and size registers that we'd have for the physical layout of figure 16.2. So the code segment in figure 16.2 started at 32 kilobytes and its size was two kilobytes. The heap segment started at 34 kilobytes and its size was three kilobytes. And the stack started at 28 kilobytes and its size was two kilobytes. I wanna do a couple of translations here to kind of give you this idea of what's happening. The concept is it's very much the same as basins and bounds but it's going to have to have some additional hardware support to decide which segment is actually being referred to. So the translations that we're doing here are a combination of figure 16.1, which is showing the address space of the process, and figure 16.2, which is the physical organization of the segments, and figure 16.3, which kind of gives us the base and the size registers for those different segments. The first translation we're going to do is for address 100. The virtual address 100 is in the code segment of this process. It's at the very top of this process. We're going to take the code segment's base address, which is 32 kilobytes, and to that we're going to add 100. This is a really straightforward translation basically because the code segment starts at zero in the virtual layout of this process. The 100 that we have is effectively an offset from that, from the start of that segment. The address 100 is less than two kilobytes, so the MMU is responsible for doing that check. Is it within bounds of this segment? And it is, so we're just going to proceed with this translation. We just add 100 to 32K and we get this new physical translation for this virtual address of 100. The next one that we're gonna take a look at is 4200, address 4200. In figure 16.1, address 4200 is in the heap region. We can't just add 4200 to the start of the heap register because we're not at address 4200 starting at the top of the heap in the virtual layout. But what we need to figure out is where in the heap that reference actually belongs to. So the approach that we have to take here is to calculate an offset into the heap. Which is this address that we're trying to reference inside the heap itself from the start of the heap so that we can make the same offset into the heap segment that we have in physical memory. 
So the approach here is to take this address that we've got, 4200, and subtract from that the start of the heap region. In this physical layout, in figure 16.1, the heap starts at 4 kilobytes. So that means that we would subtract 4096 from 4200 to get the offset into the heap region. That offset that we calculate then would be 104, and we would take that 104 and add that to the base register of the heap segment. We'd also do that check, is it within the size limit of the heap segment, and it is, so we would do the translation. If we were to do a reference to an address that goes beyond the size of the heap segment. Let's say we were to make an, a, a reference to an address that's past seven kilobytes. Seven kilobytes would be beyond the size register. We calculate that offset, subtract from seven, four kilobytes, the start of the heap region. And we determine that that goes beyond the end of the segment, the heap segment itself. And that, that, is where the MMU would raise a segmentation fault. You've gone past the end of the segment that has been allocated for you. There's a really important aside here that tells us about, you know, what a segmentation fault is. And it also tells us that it's not real anymore. We don't actually do segments in memory anymore. And when we start talking about paging, which is what we actually do in virtual memory now on modern systems, we're gonna find out that Segmentation fault is really a, an artifact of history. Segments were used. This idea of segmentation was used in practice for quite a long time, but we don't use that anymore. We use paging, but we still retain this terminology segmentation fault. Neat. So this is great. We've now got this system that allows us to generalize this idea of base and bounds, where instead of allocating an entire address space, We've got three segments, and each of these segments are going to have some small amount of space allocated to them, and we won't have this big chunk of space in the middle that's allocated, but not used by the process. We have some basic idea of what the operating system is responsible for here, and we've got some basic idea of the hardware responsibility. The operating system's responsibility is to maintain this set of values for each of the processes that happen to be running on the system. We've got some responsibility, you can guess, to manage free space with these segments, so which parts of physical memory are allocated and which are not. The hardware's responsibility is to have registers for us to put these segment values into and for the MMU to start supporting the translations with these segments. The question that we have now and the question that we're going to look at at a really high level is how does the hardware know which segment it should be using, which pair of registers it should be using to do this virtual to physical translation of addresses? One approach that we're going to look at is for the hardware to use the addresses themselves as a mechanism for deciding which segment is going to be used. So here is a little figure that kind of shows a 14-bit a address. So 14-bit virtual addresses are enough to address 16 kilobytes of addresses. So think about that for a second. This is 2 to the 14 is enough to address 16 kilobytes of different addresses. The top two bits of this address that's 14 bits wide, we're going to mark these and say that these two, two top bits are going to be the segment part of the address. The remaining bits are going to be the offset part of the address. Notice that this means that we may have fewer addresses in our virtual address space than we have in our physical address space, but, but that's okay. That's okay for now. We've got this imaginary 64 kilobyte physical memory and we've got this imaginary 16 kilobyte address space. In practice on real systems, you know, 64 bit systems do not necessarily have 64 bit address spaces for processes. They have 48 bit address spaces and that's okay. And that's okay and we're gonna keep working with that. Let's look at a more concrete example here. 4200 in binary, so this was the first translation that we were doing with this previous example from figure 
the address 4200 has a value in binary of 0, 01 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Got that? Okay, good, good. The top two bits of this address are telling us that this belongs in the heap segment. So what we've done is we've said addresses that start with zero and one are addresses that are in the heap segment. That's what we've said here. The bottom 12 bits now are actually that offset that we calculated. So we calculated that offset internally by saying 4096 minus, 4200 minus 4096. Now we can actually just look at those bottom 12 bits and that is that 104, that value of 104. So let's look again at figure 16.1. Remember, I, I kind of pointed this out. We've got this program code segment at the top and then we've got this gap that's not allocated for anything. This gap that's not allocated for anything has a really specific size. The program code plus that gap is four kilobytes. The heap segment then is going to be four kilobytes. This, there's something in the middle here that's an additional four kilobytes, and then there's the stack at the bottom that's also going to be four kilobytes in size. The address space is laid out in this way explicitly so that these top two bits of the addresses segment this entire address space into four regions. So the top two bits of zero, zero explicitly have all of the addresses that are in this program code segment. The top two bits of zero, one have all of these addresses that are in the heap segment. And the top two bits at the bottom that all start with one one are explicitly within this context of the stack segment. That's pretty neat, that's cool. So with that in mind, our hardware, our MMU, can implement something that looks a little bit like this pseudocode to determine which segment pair it should be using for the base and bounds registers to actually do the translations. The first thing it does here on line two is to get the top two bits of that virtual address. So to get those top two bits that tell it which of the pairs of base and size register to be using. Then it calculates the offset by getting the bottom 12 bits on line four. And then the bottom five, six, seven, eight, and nine lines of, of pseudocode here are basically checking, is it within the size of this segment? And if it is within the size of this segment, then do the translation using the base and size register. If it's not within the size of this segment, then raise one of those segmentation faults. So one thing you might notice about this is that we're using these two bits to address segments, and we, we've only talked about three of them. We could, in theory, have an additional segment, but there's not really an additional segment for us to use here. So, you know, in theory, we've got one segment that's not going to be used by, by anything, and that's okay, it's okay. It's also worth noting that some systems will actually use one bit for segment, which segment they refer to, and take advantage of this idea that the code segment and the heap segment are immediately next to each other, so there's no gap in between them. So a top bit of zero will say this is the code heap region or the code heap segment and a top bit of one would say this is the stack segment. So using the top n bits is it's great. It's a good way to solve this problem. It's also limiting. Using these top two bits with our 16 kilobyte address spaces is limiting us to having four kilobyte segments. So depending on the size of the address space that you're using, that value is going to change, but it's limiting, we're fixed we can only have some fixed size of address space, and we can only have some fixed size of segment within that address space using the top n bits from these virtual addresses. This is an explicit approach, using virtual addresses and parts of virtual addresses to figure out which segment is being referred to by that address. Some systems will do away with this entirely and instead use implicit approaches. The way that they figure out which address, which segment an address is referring to is to figure out where that address was actually generated from. And in, in that this is all in hardware, this is something that the hardware can do. So what I mean by this is if an address was, for example, generated by the program counter, then the hardware is able to know that that is probably something that's in the code section. 
if this was an address that's come from the stack pointer, so an, an, an arithmetic on the stack pointer, the hardware can probably know that this is an address that belongs in the stack region. And if it's not either of those two segments, then it's probably in the heap segment itself. This is great. This is really cool. We've got these segments. We've fixed this problem of internal fragmentation. We figured out how we can calculate offsets within the code and the heap segments. But what about the stack? What about that pesky stack? The stack grows backwards compared to heap and code. With the code and the heap segments, we calculate this offset and then we just blindly add it to the base of that segment. With the stack region, we've got the opposite problem. Remember, the stack goes upwards compared to downwards. So when we have these addresses within the stack region, we have to calculate a negative offset into that so that when we're referring to the segment in physical memory, we are referring to the correct location within that stack. The way that we need to approach this is assuming that we're using this explicit approach and assuming that we're using these base and size registers per segment, we need some extra help from the hardware with this. The extra help that we need from the hardware here is to have an additional bit on these base and size registers that tell the hardware whether it should use negative offsets or positive offsets. And this is figure 16.4 now. So this has been updated a little bit. We've got code, heap, and stack, and these been, have been annotated now with the two, top two bits that refer to those, so the top two bits from the virtual addresses. We've got the base, we've got the size. Its max is four kilobytes because we've got these 16 kilobyte address space. We're using the top two bits. The top two bits is gonna segment our memory into four kilobyte regions. We also have this negative growth or grows positive field, which is an individual bit. For both the code and the heap segments, this is one, it's set. This bit is set so that we can say, this does grow positively. We can just add the offset to the base itself. The grows positive is zero here now for stack because the stack is growing negatively. So what we're gonna do here is now translate a virtual address, 15 kilobytes. So this is something that is in the stack and we're gonna translate that to a physical address. The first thing we're gonna do here is convert that to binary. So this 15 kilobyte address is 111100 and then a bunch of zeros after that. The top two bits of this address tell us that this is the stack segment. The top two bits tell us that it's the stack segment and then the remaining bits are an offset, which is three kilobytes. We need to have a negative offset here. The offset that we have right now is from the top of the stack going upwards, but what we want is from the top of the stack segment going downwards. The negative offset here is calculated by subtracting this offset from the maximum segment size. So we subtract uh, three kilobytes and then we're gonna subtract four kilobytes from that. So this is different from what we were doing before with the other segments, subtracting the start of that segment, we're subtracting the full size of that segment for a negative offset here of minus one kilobyte. We add the negative offset to the base for this segment. And so we're adding 28 kilobytes plus minus one kilobyte. And from that we get 27 kilobytes. Weird. At this point, we've, we've got what appears to be a fully functional virtual memory system that uses segments. We've saved ourselves a lot of space by not allocating these full address spaces anymore, and that's really great. But it, it actually turns out that we can save more space by taking advantage of information that we know about what the segments are and about the way that processes work within an operating system. And this is kind of cool. We've saved a lot of space with this because we solved this internal fragmentation problem. And we can increase the amount of space that we're saving by taking advantage of this idea that when a new process is created, it's being forked from an existing process. We're gonna increase the amount of space that we're saving by using this idea called code sharing. Code sharing here is really explicitly going to be multiple different processes with their own individual address spaces. So they're all private address spaces as far as the process is concerned. 
we're going to use this idea that when we do a fork, we're copying that address space and we're using the same code to run both processes to start. We're going to take advantage of that. And what we're going to say is that we've got these physical, virtual to physical mappings. We've got this base and size set of registers for the code segment. What we're going to do is we're going to say that multiple different processes can have the same physical location for their code segment. This is really cool. We get to save a little bit of extra space here by not duplicating that code segment when we do this fork system call. One thing that we have to add to the hardware though to support this, so we don't just get this for free, we have to add an additional thing in the process that is permission bits on memory segments. Figure 16.5 here now adds to this. We've got our code heap and stack segment. We've got the top two bits that are used to figure out which segment set we are referring to. We've got a base, we've got a size, we've got this gross positive bit, but now we also have protection bits. The code segment here is read and execute. This is code. We should be able to read it and we should be able to run it, but we should not be able to write to it. A process that's forked from another process shouldn't be able to write into code memory because it shouldn't affect the behavior of that other program. The heap and the stack segments here are marked as read write, but not execute. They're read and write because, well, I mean, we've got to read and write the heap and the stack segments, but we probably shouldn't be able to execute anything that's in the heap and the stack segments. That would lead to bad stuff happening. So this is really great now. We've got this functioning virtual address system. We've got this functioning virtual memory system with segments. One of the problems that we kind of noticed with this top two bits thing was that we've got this extra, this extra segment that's not being used. Some operating systems in the past have taken this to a logical extreme. So instead of having segments that are going to be for code and heap and stack, we're going to have code segments, or we're going to have segments that are much finer grained. So coarse grained versus fine grained segmentation. Fine grained segmentation then is just, is taking this idea of what we've got with coarse grained segmentation and just having many, many smaller chunks of memory. This is not really a good solution. It's not something that we use right now, but it's actually leading us to where we're going to get in terms of working with real virtual memory systems going forward. And the idea that we're gonna be looking at later is called paging. It's, it's actually leaning more toward this fine grain segmentation approach than it is the coarse grain segmentation approach. We've got this vague idea of how hardware works now. We also have to think about what the operating system has to do. I've said what the operating system is responsible for kind of in passing as we're going through this, but I want to list what the operating system has in terms of responsibilities for this version of virtual memory segmentation itself. So the operating system has to have the responsibility of keeping track of the base and size registers for each of the segments for every process. And it does this in the process control block. The operating system is also responsible for actually conducting the change of the base and size registers when context switches happen. This was also true for base and bounds, but now we have more registers that we need to keep track of and more registers that we need to change on these context switches. The operating system also has to allow processes to request changes to the sizes of their segments. These segments need to be able to grow as we're doing dynamic memory allocations, as we're adding stack frames to the stack, we need the size of the segment to grow so that we can do these things. So the operating system, even though it's not responsible for servicing mallet calls, has to give the ability for something for a user process to request that the size of its heap be changed and made bigger or smaller, but mostly bigger. The OS also has to have the responsibility of, of managing free space in general. So we've got physical memory here. We've got all these segments in physical memory. Which parts of physical memory are currently in use by processes and which segments and which parts of physical memory are not currently in use by processes. This really isn't a trivial problem. 
And it's not a trivial problem, especially because segments can have different sizes. We, I just said that the operating system has to give the ability for a process to change its segment size. And I previously said, we've got these segments that have different sizes. Segments are different sizes. And this is a major limitation of segments is that they are different sizes. This actually ultimately leads to another problem that we have with managing free space, which is something called external fragmentation, where we've got these differently sized segments and each of them are going to be in memory somewhere. But as we add new processes and remove processes, we're gonna have different sized chunks of free memory. These differently sized chunks of free memory are going to lead to situations where we might need a bigger space. If we've got this heap space for one process and there's no space to expand it, we have to move that space somewhere else. If we've got a big chunk of memory that we want to allocate, we have to find a big enough space to put that. Figure 16.6 .6 shows a solution to this problem, which is compacting memory. And depending on when you took Comp 2160, this may have actually been part of an assignment that you did. One solution to this problem of external fragmentation is to compact memory, to defragment it, to just shift everything up and then adjust all the base and size registers for every process and every segment that you move so that there's this one big chunk of free memory at the bottom. The problem with that is that it actually makes it hard or impossible for, for segments to grow in size. Once you shift everything up to the top, the next time something tries to grow, you're gonna have to move it from that spot that it was in into that giant free space. Chapter 17 is going to look at this topic in detail. So it's gonna spend a lot of time talking about strategies and policies and algorithms for working with free space and maintaining this free space and giving out free space and allocating and deallocating things. So to summarize, we've, we've solved this problem of internal fragmentation. We were allocating full address spaces and we are no longer allocating full address spaces. Allocating full address spaces led to this problem of internal fragmentation where we've, where we've got this chunk in the middle of this address space that's been allocated, but it's not being used by anything. We've, so, we've, we've even solved some problems that we didn't know we had uh, by supporting things like code sharing. So we can have physical map, virtual to physical mappings for different processes where they physically map to the same part of memory. We've also added some problems and the main one that we've added here is external fragmentation. So we've got these differently sized segments and we have to find these free spaces in between them to put new things where we, we didn't really have that problem before. We also really haven't fully solved some problems. So if we have a heap segment and we've got the dynamic memory allocator just putting things into random places, We've got this problem where the heap itself, while managed by the allocator, is got a bunch of allocated space that's still not actually being used by anything. Space that's used that we could be putting other processes information into. We're gonna try and solve this problem by generalizing on this idea of segmentation by adding some constraints to it. And generalizing on this idea of segmentation and adding constraints to it is going to get us to this solution called paging. So that's it for segmentation. Thank you for listening and I'll, I'll see you all soon.